Welcome. Um, my name is Rob Huggins. I am Director of Planet Services and Academy for these guys, MEN Solutions. Um, I'm going to be a host for this evening. I am absolutely buzzing about this one. I'll tell you why in a wee minute. Um, but firstly, let's do all the housekeeping stuff. A massive thank you to those two blokes up the back there, Adam and Ricardo from Mike Mental Group. Thank you for not only being hosts for this evening, but for being top blokes and helping out with technology when needed. So thanks very much, Max. Appreciate it. We've got Max here from Product Forge. Do you want to say something just now, mate? Yeah, great. Okay. Quickly off the stage for Max. So apologies if you've uh, heard the spiel before. Can I get a quick show of hands from anyone who uh, has heard of Product Forge? Still got new people, that's great. Uh, of the people who put their hand up, how many of you knew we ran hackathons? Yeah, that's good. Great. I think that's almost 100%. Uh, so, my name's Max, I work for Forge, and we run hackathons. We have a very big hackathon in February next year, the Digital Health of Product Forge. It's uh, the third year we've run this event, and it's going to be Europe's biggest health hackathon. So, there's going to be 200 participants. People like yourselves, people interested in data, also designers, uh, healthcare professionals, students, people generally interested in building interesting digital health products. It's a three and a half day hackathon uh, that takes you through a kind of long process of identifying a problem, designing a solution, storyboarding the solution, doing research, um, technical people building digital prototypes, putting together uh, pitches. Um, comprehensive product pitches, and then pitching for the winning position at the end. Uh, it's a great way to meet new people with different skill sets and different backgrounds. It's a great way to build really cool health products um, that could potentially save lives. Um, yeah, so if you're interested in building interesting digital health products, I'm going to be here for the rest of the evening and then afterwards, so come, come have a chat. I've got some flyers, a little bit of information, and if you'd like to register your interest, you can pop some uh, brief details down there. So. Thank you very much. Thanks again. Thanks very much, Max. Cheers. Okay, okay. Health and safety hygiene stuff before we go any further. Um, there is no fire drill planned for this evening, so should you hear a fire alarm, exits are through the doors to the rear. There is a staircase directly ahead of you. Do not use the lift, go down the stairs. Um, toilets are out those doors, and ladies is there and gents is there, so that's where we are. So this evening, why am I buzzing? I'm buzzing because I know these guys, <laughs> <laughs> and I've heard them speak before. So we're really, really fortunate to have these guys with us um, this evening. This is part of FinTech Scotland Fortnite, and I'm sure most of you will have seen some of the buzz around this. Um, the last fortnight has been a series of events, meet-up groups, collaborations, projects, all ran by Stephen and Mikel over at FinTech Scotland who are doing an amazing job of raising the profile of Scotland as a, de a destination for <coughs> FinTech innovation, collaboration and obviously employment. So a massive shout out to the great work we've done by FinTech Scotland. But this brings us to these two gentlemen. So David Tracy, what a brilliant job you've got mate, Chief Analytics Officer <laughs> at Castlake Financial and Dr Richard Carter, Data Scientist at Provise, uh, to champion blocks. I'm going to shut up now and let the blokes know what they're talking about, talk about talk about. So thanks very much. David Tracy. There we go. It's after, yeah, thank you. Well, that was really kind to what you said about me. I don't know if it's true. But, uh, <laughs> um, so, uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm David Tracy. I'm from a company called Castlight Financial. So we are uh, a fintech who operate kind of in the open banking space, uh, based here in Glasgow. Uh, there are currently 27 of us. So, but uh, up from eight or nine when I joined at the start. Of Year, so we're rapidly kind of like scaling, and that's mainly being in kind of like product development, so software engineering, uh, and data science. So, um, what is it that we do? Well, I guess so. Our mission is kind of like encapsulated just in you know, a few words, and that's to build a safer financial world. And that kind of really comes from experiences maybe around about ten years ago with the, the sort of you know the big credit crunch that, that happened then and. One of our, our founders, Phil Grady, was working in the, uh, the sort of debt, debt collection, kind of like debt restructuring ID space at that point. And so he was really at the sharp end of all these people who were kind of 
you know, let down by the system, you know, decisions that were made and, you know, sort of fancy offices in Wall Street and, and, and London and, and, and the, the ensuing financial carnage that happened then, you know, he saw at the sharp end what that meant to real people in, in their real lives and, you know, he'll, he'll tell some quite kind of like actually real moving and quite sad stories about people that were, you know, driven to kind of like substance abuse, the breakup of families, deaths, you know, suicides and things that happened because people uh, were left in such horrible financial situations by, you know, the decisions that, 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 that were made. Uh, either because they were sold or missold products that they couldn't afford and then things happened and then they lost their jobs or uh, they'd just been given bad advice and then these, these things that they'd been counting on to return on investment never materialised and you're left with like you know, 60 grand worth of negative equity in your house or whatever and so so that was really kind of like the genesis of that and it, it took him a few years I think to kind of like figure out what it was and what it do, what it to do and it was only when he got talking to uh, one of our other co-founders, Martin, who was, I think at that time, kind of like sales director at Call Credit, so one of the, the three you know, big um, credit reference agencies, that they they hit upon this idea of, you know, this is before open banking, but the data must be there that you can look into someone's bank account, cast by on it, to see precisely their, their financial situation, to see what comes in, what goes out, to, to understand not just that basic arithmetic, but also the way that they, they spend their money, the risks that might be involved in that, and make better credit decisions, give better quality financial advice, make it show the path to restructuring your finances, all of these things that lead to better outcomes for for the customer and for the, the institution as well. And and just really kind of like build some products that, you know, really sort of protect the whole system from some of these things happening again in the future. So, um, so how do we do that? So, the challenge I think was first of all one of kind of like logistics. How do we get data from bank accounts into some kind of system where we can where we can analyze that? And the services out there that do that, and obviously now with open banking, that's become a lot easier. And the standard APIs that you can call. But the hard part is actually understanding how people spend their money, you know, there's lots and lots of different ways you can spend your money, there's you know, countless companies that are willing to take your money, there's fewer ways to make money, but, you know, still a lot of them, and to understand, you know, you know the, whether or not that, that spend has to happen, is it regular, is it committed, or whether it's just a bit of fun, you know, so on and so forth, you need to, you need to categorise that, and so what we've spent a lot of time doing, and maybe the reason why it's interesting for this audience is, you know, building the machine learning algorithms to take, you know, the, the plethora, the myriad ways that you can you can spend or be paid money, and turn that into like, action and insight. So, you know, so we built this this taxonomy with you know more than 180 different categories, and we've had to then, you know, build the the algorithms which then assign, you know, it's Tesco, right? Well, that's that's shopping for groceries. It's Amazon. That's an online department store. So on and so forth. And that's really the bedrock of then the product um, the portfolio that we have. So the first thing kind of like realizes that that idea that um, that Martin and Phil had a few years ago, and what calls it the four value passport. And that really is a, a I'm going to skip on to a better slide that shows all this. Um, but you know that's effectively PL for you right now over the last year. Where, how much money has been paid into your accounts, the whole family of accounts, where did it come from, is it, you know, is it salary, is it rental income, is it benefits, is it gambling winnings, is it um, uh, interest payments, is it an investment, is it something like that, you know, assigning all of those there. Then we look at all the different ways you spend the money on your mortgage, on your rent, on your shopping, on your getting to work, on um, coffees, on whatever it is that you need to spend your money on. And then we aggregate that into a package that mortgage brokers and lenders or uh, uh, loans or credit card companies or debt recovery sort of um, uh, reconciliation companies can use to understand your financial position, your liquidity and your ability to either pay for a, a product or to help you restructure given that you must you know, pay a mortgage and get to work and pay a childminder uh, and have a bit of money left over, how can you structure a, a, a better um, set of repayments to, to help you navigate your way out of whatever trouble you might have found yourself in. 
the uh, the other two products that, that underpins we, we, we kind of thought about well once we understand this is there something we can say then about not just whether someone can afford the product but can we, can we look at credit risk so you know so right now when you apply for uh, for quite a lot of things actually but you know the, the obvious ones would be like a mortgage or a credit card maybe not so obvious ones would be a mobile phone or you get insurance quote uh, or something like that, then um, you know your your repayment history of all your loans, credit cards, etc., even mobile phone bills are all uh, aggregated and turned into some kind of score and a series of other data points, and those are used to um, to assess your eligibility and what the limit of like the, the, the credit that it's extended to might be. But that's fine, and that's really predictive and has is, is been used in a lot of good credit risk but it doesn't really tell me an awful lot about the person that um, I'm kind of like thinking about here about whether or not you know I should give them half a million pounds for a mortgage or whether I should increase the limit from two thousand to three thousand pounds. You know some basic things like the mortgage is in a mortgage application your income might be assessed but you know do, do I know if this person is a saver or a spender from the credit report? No. I don't. Do I know if they like eating in, you know, high-end restaurants or whether they like, you know, eating to, you know, micro from from living there? I don't do that. But in the, the transactional data, I've some clues to who this person and their actual behaviours can maybe be unearthed and so better decisions can be made um, around credit risk or uh, the ability to repay. The final thing that, you know, we do with this data then is like to think about, well, let's say I'm a bank and I've got a million current account customers, I, I have to think about what my liability on that might be, because I need to put a number on a balance sheet which at the end of the year is my estimate of how many of my customers might not pay their credit card or might get into arrears in the mortgage. And so by aggregating all the customers together in one space, you can see you know, the, the financial I guess, liquidity, the leverage, you know, how much of their income is like absolutely must be spent on their mortgage and getting to work and so on. And then start to stress test and do kind of like scenario planning. So uh, you know what if you know fuel goes up by two percent after Brexit, what if fuel doubles in price, you know, blah blah blah, all these things and you can see then how people might um, react in those circumstances. So let me talk a little bit more about how it works. So in terms of kind of like machine learning and the data science kind of like problems that we've been set. So the categorization really falls into two categories. One is how do we how do we understand that text data? So when you go into your you know your banking app and you see Tesco, ampersand, blah blah blah, card ending X X X X X four seven eight nine, whatever, you get all kinds of junk and transactional data that just comes through in this feed from open banking or through screen scraping or whatever it is that, that, that we um, that retrieve it from the customer's account. So there's a challenge first of all at the end and challenge just to kind of make this into something that I can use that you know that uh, uh, that, that will be we can assign it to like a kind of like a, a term list or a dictionary which then becomes a feature set for some kind of machine learning problem. So is that kind of like text processing side? But then the other thing that you need to think about is well and this is especially true for people that work in well for, for, for salaries, you know when you are doing a kind of like text mining application like that, a lot of the time you you know that's you're restricted by the coverage of, of the data. So for instance Castlight, only twenty seven people will work for Castlight. Unless one of those twenty seven is in there when you see a payment from Castlight, you might think, oh, well what is that? It's not in my database, it's not in my dictionary term list. So that leads us to more kind of like inferential kind of like type of model where it's more about pattern recognition. So you know then it becomes things like well, do we see a payment of roughly the same amount at roughly the same time of the month or with some kind of recognisable cadence that then we can start to say and and some kind of uh, I guess Bayesian <coughs> kind of uh, way well given that I see this, this and this, and then going to guess the salary. And, and, and really the kind of ethos there is like thinking about the old way of doing things. If I'm 
um, <coughs> fan assessing a mortgage, and I actually did have this job 15 years ago at Direct Line Mortgages, whilst it still existed, because you looked through someone's bank statements and you had to highlight where was, you know, so I was working underwriting, where was the salary coming in. You didn't know that, you know, this company, who they were or what they did, but you could see, you, you kind of like instinctively kind of like just put together pieces, and that's the kind of models we're interested in kind of like then building so that we can teach almost the the neural network or the random forest or whatever it is to think like a person would approach this when they're presented with something that they don't understand and they need to figure out what it is. So, and that also goes into other kind of recurring or other kind of pattern type transactions like your rent. You know, so say like you're paying rent to a friend, well I don't know who David Tracy landlord is, but you know, if it says David Tracy in there and I see it's six hundred pounds on the first of the month, and maybe I'm gonna guess that it's rent over like you know, just a, a bog standard bank transfer. The other thing that we also are interested in doing and kind of thinking about is although we have our taxonomy, we know that our you know customers that we might work with have different ways of categorising data and so we are thinking about how do we sort of translate our taxonomy and map in, in ways to to theirs because you know they are you know, maybe wanting a more granular view of benefits than, than we currently provide, something like that. Affordability Passport, um, you know, so this is kind of like the, the one-stop shop for uh, for a mortgage lender, say. You know, so we, we do that kind of like income and expenditure assessment. We, we look at what's committed, what isn't, uh, what's discretionary and so on, and so that then the underwriting decision can be made. But also we um, we are, we're, we've built products that kind of like are for verifying their identity, so that the ID check is done there as part of that, that process. That if we you know, we can capture support and documentation, you know, like a passport or a bank statement or something like that as well, and get that into the uh, into the <coughs> the big fat folder that I used to kind of have to carry around, you know, direct line mortgages, you know, all that is there, stored electronically in a template which is then accepted by the broker or by the bank as their kind of standard package for assessing uh, eligibility for, for the product. And financial IQ and cash score that I kind of talked about a, a little bit more detail earlier. <coughs> so I just wanted to kind of talk maybe a little bit more about so our cash score products. This is quite I think maybe my the one I'm most interested in right now because I think it's just it's, it's so much potential and it's really different from credit scoring and that I don't know if any use the, the clear there's gotta be people who use clear score here, you know, it's so kind of like sort of well adopted and it looks great and it's really, really um really, really nice app. But the thing that's always puzzled me about it is I've done nothing and my credit rating goes up or down, I have no idea, and it will tell you something really useless, like you've been on the like, roll for 10 years, I'm like, so what, what does that mean? Why have I gone from a 501 to 503 out of 750? If I'm such a good risk, like tell me why am I not a 689 or something like that? And it's really kind of like opaque, and I don't know that it's necessarily all that relevant, and it's certainly not up to date. Um, you know, if you, work in the, if you work in the credit industry, then you know that there is this kind of reciprocity agreement where you share the data so that you can pull all of it so that we can all benefit from the decisions that are made. But you've got three different companies that are the guardians of that, that data and any one of them probably only covers about 70-75% of either population or the products that the population might take. And it's, and it's out of date where if you look at transactional data, <coughs> you're looking back in the screen screen, you can see what happened yesterday. <coughs> or two seconds ago in open banking. And so you can see, right, so this is the same customer, and the blue line is his credit score, and the orange line might be his cast score. And so, you know, it's uh, early January, paying off credit card bills for Christmas, blah, 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 goes overdrawn instantly, that's seen, noticed, and we can then assess, like, the future on the risk associated with that particular customer. We then start to see maybe things like charity standing orders being cancelled, maybe another kind of like leading indicator that there might not be roses in the financial garden. But then what we see is actually, you know, they've 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 had some pretty solid kind of saving habits which have been sustained for a period of three months. So then it starts to tick up a little bit more. Um, they do some other things that are associated with good credit outcomes, like believe it or not, gym membership. Um, kind of like shows about affluence probably is the um, the the key to that. So that ticks up. 
Then three months later, the overdraft hasn't actually been touched for three months, so let's you know, recognise that good behaviour and the fiscal discipline. But then at the same time, what happens is, well, wait a minute, credits, uh, credit score just noticed you went overdrawn three months ago. Well, but you've not actually done anything bad for three months and you've got back on a better financial footing. But then all of a sudden you've been penalised. Then, um, you know, better habits to sustain. We don't see any gambling transactions for three months, something like that. You know, the things start to tick up. And it gets to the start of June, and for whatever reason, this person's had to go to Wonka, maybe not Wonka now, Amigo, and uh, has had to get a payday loan. So that's obviously a bit of a kind of you know, worry for this, you know, thinking about affordability or thinking about future credit risk. But then on credit score, they just happen on that day to be living at the same address for three years and they get a big bump. But, and they might not even see the payday loan agreement because the coverage there is a bit spotty. And so you get this idea that, you know, the it's, it's a totally different data set, and that's been reflected in the, the work that we've done with a couple of banks. Is that the, so? This is kind of like a bit of a busy slide. Yellow is a kind of histogram distribution. The orange and the blue line are maybe the, the bad rates on a financial product with respect to either the cash or the credit score. And what you can see is that they both rank order strongly, and they, they, they tell you about the relative risk to customers, you know, depending on what the score is. But what was incredible was when we actually so what was the correlation between them? It was, you know, 0.05 R squared, completely different data sets, but they're telling you things about the customers. And so that really came through when you start to mix the data. If you take the credit data and the transactional data together, because they're orthogonal, you get this hybrid model which is stronger than anything on the market just now, and that's what we're actively building into launch. So it's it's such a kind of like exciting Product where you know we can we can give people customers a better idea of their financial situations that they with their current habits with the way that they uh, that they spend their money. You know that this could be early warnings for people that we could sort of say, look, you know, you're headed for the rocks if you do this, this, and nudge and this, this, and this, and nudge them in a better direction. Then you know, hopefully, we see better outcomes for lenders. Then we can also you know, start to support them in making better, more prudent decisions so that they don't inadvertently give people products which are, you know, maybe too big for them, which is what happened a lot of the time, you know, 10, 12 years ago when people were getting 120% limit loan value um, mortgages and things like that. Um, because we were just banking on wage inflation and house inflation just kind of taking care of it and it, and it didn't. Last, I'm just going to talk a little bit about Finance IQ, and that's a completely kind of different um, <coughs> sort of set of machine learning problems. So where the first one was, you know, kind of, well, we talked about a huge multivariate kind of classifier. I've talked about a binary, good, bad, kind of like credit classifier. This is much, may, much more maybe of an unsupervised problem. So if we've got 100,000 customers that are somewhere in my 180 dimensional space of transaction types and how much they, you know, how much they make in salary, how much they spend on their mortgage, etc., etc. How do we find where people are close together, far apart? Can we find families, clusters, and so on? And then once we we understand that, can we un can we understand the personas maybe in a qualitative way as well, and then start to describe them in ways that, you know, that. Uh, uh, can can help um, you know either like with conversations about products, or it could help with conversations about um, financial planning, or it could help with conversations about looks like you missed a couple of credit card payments. How do we get you back on you know on track with it? And so you know so there's that kind of like that 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 clustering problem, which is which is really interesting, really difficult as well because the data is fair to say. Uh, strangely structured and that there's this kind of odd combination of huge right tails because you've got people who get paid a lot of money and people who are kind of more kind of like normal mode and thing but then you get those large zero spikes as well because then you get people that don't spend anything on alcohol say or they don't spend anything on airplanes and so you have these sort of strange kind of like multimodal non-normal kind of distributed things and so that presents some of the interesting challenges about how you're actually starting to, to cluster on that because you know many of these algorithms assume kind of like 
nice continuous normal bus route with um, sort of eight steps. Also, we can do some of the, the more kind of like basic tech stuff. So if you, you know, we're talking to, to a particular person, uh, you work in the bank, and you want to understand without going through, you know, the last thousand transactions what the person spends the money on, then we can present. You know, so this, for instance, this person, the the keywords that are jumping out are Amazon, online, PayPal, Baby, Smith's Toys. So this might be someone that's. You know, thinking about or or has has recently started a family or something like that. You know, and so you can, you can have those kind of like better conversations, more informed, more sympathetic, more empathy. You know, about the, the the situation that the person is in. So that's the that's the the basic idea about what we do. Some of the problems, the data that, that that we look at. I mean, this is this is quite interesting, quite kind of like new for us as well. It's what I was talking about earlier. You know, the idea that we can segment. Um, you know, a, a, a portfolio you know, of say, current account holders look at how secure or, or not we are, are they underwater, are they relying on external finance like credit cards or overdraft to get through the month um, how much resilience would they have to, to change on a portfolio level and individual level so that you know, banks and customers alike can make better decisions about what, what they should be doing um, you know if these these things happen. I think that's uh, I think that's me. So yeah, that's that's all I wanted to say. All I wanted to talk about. So thanks very much for listening. So no questions for David? Anything to kick us off? So the, the question I guess was about product strategy, it was about whether or not we're contemporary business to business, so whether we were thinking about kind of like our customer facing aggregating platform. So right, right now we are fully regulated in bank AISP, so we are able to aggregate um, uh, multiple accounts from multiple providers. We also have um, uh, you know, a, a, a scraping uh, interface as well, so like for the challenger banks or some of the big banks that haven't quite got the open banking working yet, and we can, uh, uh, we can, we can scrape and do all that. Right now the strategy has maybe been more business to business to customer, so maybe rather than necessarily developing a, a yield or, uh, or something like that, the potentially being the categorization like engine behind that, I think is the, the place where, where we are just now, uh, and also certainly helping banks categorise like on demand at scale, up, update the you know the, the risk point of view, update the risk models. That's the um, that's the strategy for now. But yeah, I mean, you know, I, I kind of think I look at guys like you. Okay, they're owned by IMG, so like maybe they don't have problems making money, or they don't care about where they make money. It's maybe more about just kind of looking at a kind of. It's like an introducer or an origination platform, but I've yet to figure out <coughs> what the revenue model for a lot of these companies are. So, where we, you know, we charge people for aggregating the data together, we charge people for doing transaction sort of categorization, and so on. There's a clear like way that we make money where you know we don't give it away for free. We don't hope that someone's going to take a you know 35 percent APR credit card at the end of it, which is maybe a clear score. In a way. Questions? Yeah. This is a very specific question. I just moved from overseas. Yeah. And so this product actually has the, um, looks like the sort of thing that I've been using for my years. <coughs> Never not worked for the past 20 years, but can get a mobile phone, have insurance protected, because I've just taken 10 years overseas. Yeah. Um, is this product going to mean that um, you'll look at overseas data and uh, things like that? or? Is so, uh, so the question is how does it work for people that have come from overseas and maybe add, add other thin file people as well. So, so thin file I guess means people who don't have credit history in the UK. 
so, uh, so the short answer is yes. Uh, one of the main markets that we, we want to help uh, companies do better at is people that, you know, like yourself, that have been professionals with long kind of track records of like, you know, working abroad and being able to bring that. It's part of why we call it the Valley Passport, so we can give that to the person to take with them and so that they can be assessed on on the, the basis of their actual income and expenditure rather than you know you not had a loan in the UK for 10 years and, and we've seen that with a couple of people that work at the company we've got a, a, a guy that's come out of the army you know so being a UK national lived in the UK and abroad but for 20 years never had to have any kind of financial product didn't need a car didn't need a mortgage blah 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 had lots of cash and no problem repaying like a mortgage whatever but couldn't get one uh, similarly, we've got a guy sitting there from, from Italy that couldn't get a mobile phone when they arrived, so it's the same kind of situation that, that you're in. Uh, in terms of how we actually um, sort of onboard the data from overseas, and so that's something that we're working on, and part of what we are interested in and, and looking to develop is how we localise the, the text transaction um, analysis uh, in French or Italian. Or or into non-Latin character um, uh, uh, sort of strings as well. So uh, it's something that we are actively looking at, and that is the vision is for people to basically have this, you know, portable and to take it with them, and they can share it with whomever they, they want. And I know you mentioned the B word, but it could be get, it could be, you know, thought of as a ledger, which you know, <coughs> portable and um, you know. You, have kind of verified and so on as well. So that's that, that definitely is within our, our product roadmap and something we actually want to do. And just on top of that, is there sort of non banking data? Is that something that we consider as well? Or? Uh, so right now we, we look at um, uh, just bank account data. We are uh, also we've done some open credit card data as well. Uh, do you mean in terms of like, could I take my I don't know, my uh, no claims discount with me across multiple kind of territories. Well, I guess we're thinking sort of, um, there was, it sounds very far fetched, but kind of like a personality test type thing. Like if you could do, uh, you know, sort of, if I allowed you to review my email history and you go through and say, this guy's a volatile individual and he's, you know, just kind of trying to do some sort of assessment around that to um, really make me an individual as opposed to a, I mean, that might be a bit far fetched. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that. We do have some non-bank data and then we have like credit data and ID data and things like that. Um, I think that what, you know, if an uh, organisation had a real need for something like that and they wanted to build models on it to assess risk or to assess affordability or something, then it's definitely something we'd, we'd look at. But right now, I guess, our wheelhouse is that kind of like banking, credit card, ID verification data and then, you know, let's see what, what comes out of that. Kind of a GDPR question. Uh -huh. <coughs> credit agencies are not really answerable to you know the likes of people that have not managed to get credit because their customers are the banks, yeah. and yet they scrape up information about everyone from everybody who can get it. Yeah. yeah. Um, a lot of people say, oh, you know, the market will fix this, but the reality is, I'm you know I'm not a customer of a credit agency. No, no, yeah, yeah, right. So and then and then one of them goes and loses a bunch of data. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Or they basically tar me with something that says, yeah. oh, no, you can't get that mortgage, you can't get this not Why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, are you doing anything about that that makes you more answerable to the individual rather than your customer of the bank? Yeah, so, uh, so the thought about the passport belongs to the customer. At every stage in the customer journey, they are asked, <coughs> you know, explicit permissions, <coughs> can we get this data? You know, this is the uses that we'll make of it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's all explained. But then the final part of it is: this is the summary, and it's only shown to you as the customer. And this is the data that we've taken, and this is like you know what we've computed, and you you know you know we've assigned all these transactions to these categories, and you know we think this is gambling, we think this is broadband, we think this, this, and this. And then at the end of the day, at the end of that journey, the customer is asked explicitly: do you agree with all this? Is there anything? like to change so if we misclassified anything and then ultimately are you okay to share it to to the broker or to, to the bank so and they thought about the passport that kind of uh, that mortgage application type kind of use then uh, 
then it's it's owned by the customer and it's the customer's decision at the end to share it with the, the person that's asked them to fill in the passport. In terms of the uh, the use case where it's maybe the bank has got um, uh, a lot of uh, you know, they've got a lot of customers and they want to understand like what people do with their money. There's, it's kind of more like a BI sort of product then, where it's just we are enriching the, the, the data and then it's, you know, that's, that's more of a kind of customer understanding uh, from the bank's point of view type product. Um, it's, not, it's not part of that kind of decision process. Um, maybe I disregard the customer experience and just talk about why do you think that financial institutions either have taken a long time or just haven't clocked on to the fact that they're missing out on a huge segment of the market that could be kind of sustainable? Yeah, um, so so I, I come from insurance background rather than a, a credit background, but um, it's probably for the same reason. You, f you fear you don't have a lot of experience and, and if you've never decided to, you know, give 10,000 18 year olds with, you know, part time jobs credit cards, then you're probably pretty unlikely to start. In a similar way to insurance, where if you've not seen, you know, 10,000 18 year olds kind of you know, claims experience, then you're unlikely to underwrite at any kind of like sane price, you know. So, so I think a lot of it is that the. The, in the the mainstream, then the you know the, the approaches just don't lend themselves to small volume data points with a lot of volatility, and I think that that's a big reason why people you know they, they don't they don't necessarily want to get into that market you know that underbanked market of you know thin thin files people new in the country people with um, you know CCGs or bankruptcy. I mean a lot of the time one of the things that we are trying to show is that. You know, well, so some of the, the numbers, this is quite scary, and that you know, I, I can't remember exactly numbers, exactly numbers, but I'm, I'm not too far away in saying that 20% of households in the UK couldn't find 500 pounds like in short notice and things like that, and so that means you are a bust type away from like you know having your credit card or a payday loan, you're you know you're you're a, a, a broken leg away from you know. Having to cancel like your Sky TV or whatever, you know, to, to make up for the, the time you've had to take off work, and so it's a lot of people get into these circumstances not because they're, they're bad risks or bad people or, or whatever or reckless or anything like that. It's just the situation we find ourselves in today with the financial market, and you're just one set of unfortunate circumstances away from to, to your point to being tarred with that brush forever, like. I got my three pay, uh, credit card payments in a row. I'll never lend to them again, and it's not. Um, I, th I think you're right. You know, there is a huge missed opportunity where I think that the main, the mainstream sort of banking industry could be with with better insight, a lot more aggressive than going after them. The problem is all these kind of expenses, and they are quite interesting, but they are completely unidirectional thinking about all the banking system. What about are they being working on before the customer? Because if they can include everyone exactly on the same system, the system is going to be a little bit blunt. Because for the bank or the financial institution, everything's there. But how? to be something completely operational if the planning doesn't have absolutely any way, any opportunity in order to know what is happening with his financial life. Actually, as a planning, every time you've got a problem, the only response you got for the bank or whatever is absolutely none. Okay, it's not fine. Why? No, sorry. I can tell you why. In the meantime, this kind of system we are not a little bit more democratic, it's a little bit difficult to manage the reality because it's only one part of the equation. What about the other part? Because they are talking about the clients, and the clients, the final target of everything. But as a client, I don't have absolutely any opportunity in order even to know what's happening with my financial life. Yeah, so, so I guess the, the question was maybe, or the, the comment was about sort of the 
the lack of transparency, I guess, and the, the, the lack of control that people have. Uh, I agree. <laughs> so in short, yeah, and, and, and that, that's something that, you know, if I go back to, um, to you know, something like uh, this, you know, where, um, You know, you can see with a bit more clarity how our models work anyway. And I think, you know, there's a, there's a, I think that there's a discussion to be had about how much of it is necessarily exposed to the customers who don't want to enable gaming of the, the system, you know, because that could be, you could have unintended consequences if everyone uh, is aware of absolutely every kind of part of it. But then at the same time, if you want to do things like, you know, let's say, Build a product that says, uh, "I am forty. I want to retire at sixty with a pension that's going to pay me fifty grand a year. What do I need to do today in order to get there?" Then showing people, I guess, maybe the consequences of the of the everyday financial decisions that they make, and what that might mean: a for future value of the money that they have and be access to financial products, you know, to encourage better habits or uh, more risk averse uh, kind of behaviours, then, then that, that's something I think that looking at the transactions, placing it in the hands of the customer, giving them ownership of the data and control over who sees and who uses it, I think that, that hopefully is a step in the right direction, uh, away from the, away from kind of like the, you know, the, the opaque, out of date, rhythm protecting debt, you kind know, of like, Credit models that we sometimes receive and use today. Is gaming and not just a good thing because you know, they, they are becoming better financially? Um, by gaming it? <laughs> in, the, in the period of time that they're doing that. You know, so I think it's like, you know, to what extent can I let up to change the spots, you know. So I think it's it's it shouldn't be about giving for me, I think that the, the bad or the unintended outcome might be that someone does short-term good things and then takes a long-term risk that they can't actually sustain um, or deal with, and that, that would be my worry in the, the gaming and the sense. I don't know if anyone's seen what happens in the States with things like an Expedia. People already game it. You get told a lot of things like, pay yourself a credit card. Don't not use it. Buy something and pay it off properly. The credit rate will pick up. Yeah. Whereas this system up here is well, let's look at your behaviours. And it's the other way around. It's not the bank is the customer, but the individual is the customer. So, yeah, I like yeah. the consultancy, like, uh, and it did like doorstep loans, and it was very much that would take a little loan to pay back, and you get access to a big loan, and then disappear. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And just the intrigue is that they get insight to you, but the gym membership starts, and yeah. that's a good sign. Yeah. Was that, I mean, you're always, you get the main experts there. Was that something that they knew as a signal, or did that fall out with what supervised learning? Uh, about both. So there, there is, and uh, that this course was kind of like, uh, in the first instance, because when we were building product, we didn't have a lot of data, it was expert judgment applied, but then we've got some machine learning. <laughs> on the volumes of that as well. So um, but a lot of it was maybe just the old fashioned kind of public tables and decision tree kind of number crunching to see, you know, can you see anything falling out and then testing it to make sure it made kind of qualitative sort of expert sense as well. And so I think the gym membership is, is you know it's uh, you get into a contract, it is it's uh, probably a a moderate or weak kind of like indicator of, of affluence, you know, so uh, it's, it's probably, it makes sense qualitatively. I'm not a credit expert, so I'm thinking how to make the model like, um, do it. But, um, but yeah, things like that, things like, um, you know, giving money to charity, you know, it's, it's kind of like, uh, it's, it's getting into the whole sort of moral puzzle kind of thing, to a sense as well. Okay, that was nice. Okay. All needs to be done is. Thank you very much.
we're going to do a very quick take switch over here. Are we using the same one? Um, I haven't seen what we've got yet, but I think it's on here somewhere, is it, Adam? Should be here, just mash keypad with fists. So it should work. Good? Not yet. Did you? Oh, it's open. There we go. Fantastic. Hey. Ladies and gentlemen, Richard. Thanks, Rob. Right, so good evening, everyone. Uh, it's great to see you. It's a good turnout. I'm just going to start actually with a bit of a personal thing. I just want to say it's great to be invited to this talk. But I mean, specifically because this data science and technology meetup, uh, Rob and I were at the very, very first one ever, sort of three years ago now. And um, I was part of the data, which I'll come on to, but it's kind of great to see that this has grown and, and it's still going it's sort a of. Thing, it's, a thing, it's, yeah. it's now a thing, yeah, yeah, you know, with thousands of members, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, we were there at the start. But that was then, this is now. So, um, that's me. I'm going to start with the kind of usual show of hands, right, just to gauge your audience. Um, so, how many people here are sort of comfortable in the knowledge of uh, B2B commerce and uh, trade finance? One or two of the three, okay. And how many of you are comfortable around data science, machine learning, and the sort of technical sphere? Okay, so there's more. So that's kind of quite good, right? Because uh, what I've deliberately done in this talk is, is try to sort of come at it from a point of very little or no knowledge of either trade finance, which was certainly actually me four months ago, so I was, I was in that position not too long ago, or, and or no machine learning data science knowledge. So, Hopefully everybody here should at least understand something. If you don't understand anything at all tonight, right, there's one thing you've got to remember, which is that what Provise is all about, and Provise is all about, you can see it down the side of every slide there, getting businesses paid instantly, right? So that's what Provise is. And the way we do that, I'll come on to it, it's all about using smart technology to um, assess the risk of an invoice uh, and predict whether it's likely to be approved and paid eventually and we'll hopefully pay that money instantly to the supplier. So I'll cover all these details, but that's us, provides we're all about getting suppliers paid instantly. Um, just a little bit about me. Um, God, I feel old sometimes when I look at a room full of scientists, but I kind of started with a, a maths degree, and then I guess my career path went in what a mathematician might call a non-linear trajectory. Um, I did end up working in the city for a while somehow, I don't quite know how I ended up there, but um, it was fun. Back in the 90s, early 2000s, on the trading desk at Goldman Sachs in, in uh, electricity and power. I actually came back to Scotland, having done an undergrad here, um, to do a PhD on poker, and um, was intending to go back to London and do financial work, but actually uh, discovered I could have more fun sitting at home building models on sports, so somehow managed to escape having a job in the entirety of my 30s. I actually wonder, David, how this would have worked with yours, because as I was sitting there and you see, this, see that gambling income is a kind of negative thing, right? I mean, I literally, for 12 years of my life, had no money coming in, apart from gambling income, that was the only form of income I had, so maybe your models wouldn't have really helped me very much there, but um, it was quite a pain when I went to the bank to ask to borrow some money, because, you know, I'd actually been a professional gambler in about sort of five or six years, and I didn't actually really want to borrow an awful lot, but because my income was clearly quite volatile, and, I mean, I didn't make money, every year, but I didn't necessarily make money every month. Um, but computer said no, and uh, there you go. So anyway, that was me. Um, anyway, it's, it's boring sitting on your own building sports models after a while, believe me, you get sick of talking to yourself. So I got back out into the real world and joined the Data Lab, which is how I know Robin and the guys from MBN. Uh, have you heard of, the, heard of the Data Lab? I think hopefully by now you have. Um, yeah, I mean, that was fantastic, right? I was a data scientist there, and um, as I say to people, I mean, one of the best things really about working there was you meet all these businesses throughout Scotland who are using data, different industries, different ways of using it. People at the start of the journey, people sort of later on. Um, but you really get a good sort of oversight of what businesses are doing in the data space in Scotland. And certainly then when I heard about this job at Provise, uh, you kind of developed a sniff test on, you know, do I think this is a good idea, bad idea? Uh, and without a doubt, I mean, Provise was by far the best idea in the two and a half years of the data that I came across. So 
you know, I was absolutely delighted um, when they offered me a job. So I've only been there three months. As I say, I don't have any particular background in uh, trade finance, but you know, let's hope we're fast learners. Uh, if you're wondering who this chap is on the right, yeah, no idea. He's provised man. He he just appears, right? He's he's just some some guy. If you ever meet him on the street, you know, say hello. But uh, don't know who he is. But these five guys are the real provised men, right? These are the five co-founders. So a little bit about you know the sort of history of the company. Um, five guys, smartest five guys you'll ever see in one room at the same time. Unbelievably uh, strong uh, sort of supporting team we've got there. Um, Basically, the guy in the middle is a Glaswegian, so I'm in his home city tonight. Uh, he, David uh, Brown, some of you may well know him. Uh, if you don't know him now, you probably will get to know him. He's that kind of guy. Um, he had a previous business in this kind of trade finance world. Had this brilliant idea, actually, of why can't we just pay people the day they send an invoice? Um, and then the rest of the team has kind of um, been brought together around this to kind of prove the concept. So I think. Uh, Julio had some data from KPMG, uh, Philip who'd worked at Goldman's as well as uh, uh, did some kind of uh, proof of concept modeling, proved it kind of worked with some real data and then got on board Andre, a very experienced uh, tech guy and uh, Paul our CEO also from Goldman's and, and that's the sort of core team there. So got a really, really strong uh, core team there. In terms of where we're based, we're kind of very proud to uh, be Scottish in many ways. Um, it actually looks like we're far more international than we really are. I'm going to point out that <laughs> some of these points are only actually one person in these places. But, um, <laughs> you know, we're well positioned for geopolitical risk, I think, is the, is the kind of catchword, especially in, in these days where you don't know what's happening with, uh, with Brexit and Trump. But anyway, the main commercial uh, team is in London, and in London we've got about sort of 10 or 12 people down there, I guess. Um, the main technical team, or teams, are here in Scotland, specifically in Glasgow, so in the clock tower building where I think we might have been due to be tonight, we've switched venues. Um, we have the main core of the technical team there, the, the developers, software engineers, and also I put a little thing on there for Edinburgh because that's where I'm based. There's only two of us in Edinburgh, but it's important we don't get forgotten about. So uh, I'm a data scientist, Steve, my colleague is a, is a developer, but very much we kind of recognize, you know, especially through the work I've seen as well personally with the data lab that Scotland got a really, really strong technical data community and certainly David, the, the founder, um, when he came up here and had a look around at, uh, at Scotland, he recognised that and so we're very keen to build the technical function up here. Um, my boss, Philip, is based in Bonn. Uh, the CTO is in New York and uh, we have uh, a developer friend who's out in Vienna. So yeah, we, we sort of covered the globe so far. Right, let's get on to some more interesting stuff. Oh yeah, who recognises that building? So that's it. It doesn't look like that at all, but you'll see we have this kind of thing about yellow. I'm not quite sure where it comes from, but uh, no, that's actually King's Cross. So if you're ever passing King's Cross building and you want to know where Provise is, look to the top right. It's not that colour in real life, though. Okay, and so where's the company now? So the, the company was founded really about sort of two years ago, I guess it all came together. A lot of proof of concept work, getting data sets in, sort of seeing like, can we actually look at invoices and predict which ones will eventually get paid? Um, that's now, that's now, as I said, about two years ago that the original work was done and we kind of built up from there. Very pleased to announce in the last month that we got our Series A funding. So that was led by Augmentum Finance in London and also Bessemer uh, out of Silicon Valley. So that's $7 million that we got there. And I mean, that's fantastic now because that really kind of helps us to scale. And we, we, you know, we need more people, right? We need to scale. So I mean, when I joined just three, four months ago, I think I was like number 15, 16, I think the latest uh, head count now is, is already up to about 29 so we're really kind of ramping up and that's across all parts of the business right okay so that's a bit about the company now we get to the interesting bit so trade finance so what I'm going to show you is for those people who do understand trade finance this is a super super simplified um, caricature of how it actually works right but apologies for that but we're getting to the details you know, I'm going to lose my audience. So, simple slide, right? We have a supplier who supplies goods or services to a buyer. Okay, so far so good. Buyer pays supplier. So, what's the problem? Anybody, what's the problem? Why does providers exist? 
Exactly, yeah. Thank you very much, sir. It is. Simple as that. The payment's delayed, right? I, I mean, this just happens. Uh, it happens in all, in all sort of manner of things. It doesn't happen in, in the sort of consumer world, right? So when you go to Starbucks and you order your coffee, you don't sort of take your coffee, say thanks very much, I'll pay you in three days time. You know, you, you pay there and then. But in the business to business world, this is just, this is kind of the norm. And actually, some of the payment terms that you see, um, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, I think even Carillion that, that went bust recently was up to 120 days. So you do some work and then you've got to wait four months before you get paid for it, right? And the issue there is that for particularly the small guys, the small uh, businesses, they really have troubles in managing the cash flow, right? Because they do some work, but they need the money, right? Because they've got to pay their employees, they've got to pay their costs, they might have supplies of their own they've got to pay. So managing this kind of working capital, as it's called, this cash, is tricky for them. And what a lot of them have to do is they have to either go to the bank, take money out of some credit cards, find other kind of means of getting funding, but the, the key point here is that because they are small businesses, the banks see them as risky, and so the rates at which they lend money is going to be relatively high, right? So that's kind of the issue. So, I mean, this creates a whole heap of problems. I mean, actually, you know, in some senses, suppliers can actually raise the prices that they sell to the buyers at because they think, well, I'm not going to get my money for three months, therefore, I've kind of, you know, and the whole system effectively is broken. So what we're doing at Provise is we're trying to sort of fix that. I mean, here's some stats just around um, what the actual problem is. And this is not a UK problem, this is a global problem, right? Nobody has kind of cracked yet. This is, this is what we're taking on. Some stats here, 77% of suppliers suffer 50,000 uh, small businesses bankrupt. Shh, talking it. 50,000 uh, suppliers bankrupt every year by slow payments. And another thing is actually a lot of the suppliers have to spend time on the phone because you'll do some work for somebody <coughs> and then you end up ringing up. Have you got the invoice? Yes. Have you processed it? When am I going to get my money? When am I getting my money? And, and this kind of thing, you know, just slows the whole system up and people sort of waste time. So that's the reason why um, Provise exists, to fix exactly this problem, right? So again, super simplified, but it's kind of important just so that you understand before I get on to talking about what we're actually doing in the data science team, is how the invoice timeline works. So if I'm a buyer, I might kind of say, right, I want to, from you, the baker, I want a loaf of thousand pounds worth of bread, please. So I send out a purchase order to the baker. That's the first point on the timeline. Then at some stage, I take delivery of that bread and I get the invoice for it. Now, invoice received, Although it sounds like I got the invoice, what invoice received here means is at what point do I, the buyer, put it onto my electronic system, right? So it's, it's one thing to kind of get the invoice, but it's another thing to actually receive it in terms of, right, it's now actually on my what's called an ERP system. So I've got it, I've got a sort of electronic record of, of that invoice now, and I now know I have got that. Um, then what happens is often an approval process, which can take a week or two. So approval means that, um, well, you want to kind of say, well, I've got this invoice now, but did I actually order any bread? And uh, if I did order bread, uh, did it arrive? You know, and, and, and if, I, if it did arrive, did it all arrive? Did all, you know, were all the loaves kind of fresh or were half stale, etc.? So there's this kind of long process there in approval. And then there might be sort of terms that you've set. So you might say, well, I'll, I'll agree to pay 30 days after the invoice uh, date. And then eventually, eventually you'll get paid. So you can see now why this timeline is so long because of these different stages along it. And so this is the traditional model. So what happens is if the terms on your invoice say, you know, we'll pay you sort of 30 days or 60 days after invoice, if you're lucky, you'll get it banged on that 30, 60 days. Quite often it's late. I think the stats are that in the US, um, it's about a third of payments are late. And I think in, in Western Europe, it's about 40% of payments are late. But if you're lucky, you'll get it around the time that, you're, that your terms dictate. There are some um, people out there, I don't, I don't want to go into this at all, but there are people who do what's called supply chain finance, and they will say, well, as soon as the supermarket has said that actually we approve this invoice, we've done all the checks, and we agree that this is an invoice that we are going to pay, then there are people who will kind of pay at that point, but they charge very high rates and there's a lot of cumbersome implementation involved around them. But what we at Provisor are doing is we're saying, as soon as we see the invoice on the ERP system, as soon as it's received, we will pay there and then. In fact, it clicks overnight, so it's the next day. But 
we're going to, as soon as we see this invoice, we're going to pay it. Assuming that it passes through our data science models, etc., machine learning models, so we're going to risk score it and see what kind of risk there is in terms of will this invoice eventually get approved and paid or not. Okay, and as Provise goes forward, I mean, we're still a young company. Um, we're actually going to look towards essentially paying people as soon as the purchase order goes out. So if you're the baker, you're kind of sitting there one day and then somebody from a supermarket will ring you up and say, I want a thousand pounds of the bread and then suddenly you'll have a whole heap of money come immediately just because somebody's ordered bread from you, right? So does everybody kind of follow that? Because this is kind of crucial to what comes next. I mean, this is the problem we're solving, right? So as a mathematician, I kind of uh, hate to hear solutions without understanding what the problem is first because it's kind of meaningless. But it looks like you're all engaged. Good. All right, that's important. So, if you think back to the first diagram I had, which was the kind of box and sticks about, well, how does trade finance work today? How does trade finance work with providers? Again, super simplified, but you can see that in this world now, the supplier still provides goods and services to the buyer, so that's all fine, right? But he gets paid instantly by us, effectively, and we get the money now from a funder. So we're kind of, we sit in the middle of this kind of triangle. The buyer on their part, the guy who's ordered the bread in my example, he doesn't have to do anything, right? He doesn't have to change anything. He's still going to pay, after, if he's going to pay after 60 days, he still pays after 60 days, right? But he kind of pays through us. Again, it's, there's kind of technicalities here, but let's not go into them. He pays through us, so we get the money, and then we can pay back the money that we've borrowed, but this is at a low rate, right? And this is the kind of key point. <coughs> in the first incarnation of this diagram, you think the money was coming from the funder at a high rate because the money was being lent directly against the risky business, right? In this model, because we paid straight away, the risk is now, well, we're not going to get the money back from the buyer, right? But the buyers that we're dealing with, these are big multinational companies, right? So they've got really good credit ratings, really low, um, really low risk. So now we can borrow money at a much lower rate, and then that gets passed through. So this is kind of this is the idea that David had years ago. Brilliant idea, really. I mean, you know, completely revolutionary idea. Um, whilst it's simple to kind of put it up on a slide like this, it, it takes an awful lot of implementation because. We're dealing with, with the buyers, so what's great for us is a lot of the other systems deal with suppliers that kind of go and find all these suppliers. What we can do is we can go to one supermarket and say, if you sign up to provide, we can help you get your suppliers on board so we can deal with one customer effectively, the supermarket, but they might have 5,000, 10,000 suppliers so they can bring them on board through our system. I mean, I should say, obviously this doesn't come for free, right? So if I've ordered a thousand pounds worth of bread um, I'm not going to get a thousand pounds if I get the money a month earlier. However, the fee is really, really small. So it's one percent for 30 days pro rata, right? And we did some um, what's the word like questionnaire. Well, we, we hired some people to do a questionnaire with us with a lot of UK suppliers, and we kind of said, would you rather have 100 pounds a month's time or 99 pounds today if you're a small business? And 93 percent of respondents said they would rather have 99 pounds today rather than 100 pounds in one's time because for them, you see, it helps to manage their cash flow and they can kind of, well, I can show you actually some of the things because, funnily enough, my next slide has a few of these things. So everybody wins, right? The suppliers, so these guys, I mean, they've got certainty in our, our own cash flows now because they don't have to kind of forever ring up chasing the money. Um, they don't have to worry about defaulting because as soon as they send the invoice, as long as it passes our risk score, we can pay them the next day. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but from the buyer's point of view, it's important to note that the buyer wins because of the money that's generated in the program, the vast majority of this money actually goes to the buyer, right? So it goes to the supermarket. So thinking about this, it's quite a clever thing, because what we have to do is, in order to build a data science model of, say, suppliers supplying into a supermarket, right, we have to kind of say, well, what's the probability that these things will get approved and paid? Well, we can't do that in general. We need to know for this particular buyer, for this particular supermarket, what is the probability, you know, so if you're, if you're buying bread from Warburton's, I mean, how often do you actually approve and pay you know, bread invoices from Warburton's? So we need their data. So we can't do what we do without their data. So the incentive for them is, well, if they give us our, their data, we're actually paying them for it. 
And by them giving us their data, all they have to do is give us essentially a CSV file every night. All we need to do is say, well, what new invoices have you had today? And then we can add those to the model. So it's like a super simple process for the buyer, um, but they've got this massive incentive. And actually, the numbers that we're talking about are in the millions. So for essentially just providing one CSV file 365 days a year, they're getting you know, the ones we've looked at in the orders of sort of five, <coughs> six million or so per annum. Uh, which is just a revenue stream for them for, for doing very, very little. So you can see why the buyers are so kind of excited about this themselves. And then for the funders, these are the people that we work with. So, I mean, when I said we lend the money, it's obviously not coming out of our pocket, certainly not mine, but we're working with very well-known banks who are very happy to fund this because it's a new revenue stream for them. It's a kind of new asset class in a sense, these uh, pre-approved invoices. And, um, yeah, I mean, it... Um, to be honest, the first time I heard about this, I just thought, do you know what, this sounds too good to be true, right? I mean, this is one of these things where everybody seems to win, there's gotta be a catch, right? But there isn't, I mean, it's, it's a brilliant idea. So I will kind of talk, uh, that's the business background, so hopefully at least now you've got some kind of sense of, of what we're doing. Um, now I guess I'll go into the how we're doing it bit. Again, apologies for those of you, and it does seem like the majority of you know data science machine learning really well, but I don't want to lose my audience and I don't want to get too sort of technical, but you can see here we just have, as, as most of you guys who are working in this field will know, data in some kind of machine <coughs> learning model in the middle and a probability coming out. And this is, as I say, when we get the data on the invoice, we look at that and say, well, what is the probability that that invoice will be approved, or pay, um, approved and eventually paid? And if it goes above a certain threshold, then we kind of say, right, well, actually, we think this is a kind of safe or good invoice to pay, so we're happy to fund it, and we'll pay it straight away, and then claim the money back at a later point in time. If, we, if we're not happy, then that's great for the buyer as well, because maybe that flags up something that they will, they need to now look a bit closer at these invoices themselves, so it kind of does some, some of that kind of work for them. And, um, but really, in the data sets that we've looked at so far, Actually, the vast majority of invoices uh, we are happy to to, uh, to fund and pay because, again, we're dealing with very very large buyers. I should say, I mean, I'm not allowed to name names, but um, we're dealing with a well-known UK retail group. Um, the, uh, there's a, an Australian uh, insurance company, a couple of tier one investment banks, and uh, and a group involved in a very well-known. Daily newspaper, um, amongst others, but these are kind of guys we're dealing with. So very, very big companies again with lots of suppliers, and um, so uh, yeah. So I mean, a lot of these people have recurring suppliers that um, you see this in the data, and then you kind of you can train models very accurately over which invoices get paid and which don't. Uh, again, look, this is data science 101. But for those of you who don't know, I mean, what is the process? Well, we have to get this data. As I say, it's from ERP systems. The data is actually surprisingly dirty. I mean, even though this is companies, you know, internal data, um, there's a lot of flexibility in these systems like Oracle and SAP as to how you actually set up certain things. So uh, we have to do some data prep to in ensure that we're actually getting the right data. And, and then there's some kind of connectors that we use to, to plug it into our, into our tech stack. Um, but then once we've actually got a kind of clean data set, then people like myself can can get excited and um, do some real data science work so we can train and test models um, and, and this kind of usual process that I'm sure you're all familiar with. I guess the, the thing at the bottom there maybe is something slightly different. I mean, we have to, we, we certainly start off when we get a new customer on board, what we do is we do a kind of historical back test them, right? So we kind of say, just give us three years of your data, we'll train a model on the first two years and then we'll run it as a historical simulation on last year I will show you, if you'd have used provides last year, this is the money that you would have made. Because as I say, it's, it's not just the suppliers who are benefiting from having payment on the first day, but the buyers are also receiving this data access charge. Okay, and the kind of data sources we're using, these, these are from the ERP systems. Um, what we're, what we're looking to do though is bring in, I mean some of these things we're actually using now, some of these things we're starting to use like purchase order information. So again, if we can see that a purchase order has gone, gone out for some goods, then that gives us more indication that there's more chance that actually it was ordered and therefore when the invoice comes in that actually it's going to get
getting matched and then eventually paid. So you can see how that works. But we're also looking at external data sources as well. So, you know, for example, if can we get some information from Companies House, look at the supplier, is there any information there and how do we categorise? Because categorisation is a very big part of what we're having to tackle. How do we categorise invoices, but the suppliers and all different manner of means. So, you know, this is this is kind of the direction we're going in and um, as I'm sure David well knows, you know, it's it's an interesting challenge, right? It's um, it's uh, it's not so straightforward. So, in terms of our scoring algorithm, um, in a sense, it's just a simple binary classification problem, right? So you have an invoice, and you're going to look at this invoice, and you're going to say, well, what are the features that I can train a model on? So if you want, you can take a kind of simplest binary classification algorithm, say logistic regression, and say, right, well, what features have I got here to train a model on? Well, I've got the supplier name, right? I need to know, well, who's this invoice from? I've got the supplier amount. Well, you know, is this for a whackingly large amount or, or is it a kind of reasonable size? Um, there might be some kind of periodicity. So you might say, well, I'm getting invoices from that person through the same Monday at the start of every week. So we can sort of you know, use that as a feature. So there's certain features that you can kind of glean just from looking at the headlines. But then also what we've started to do as well is look at the physical invoices themselves, right? So, and then using natural language processing to kind of say, well, if we actually look at the invoice, can we see exactly what the invoice was for? And if we see it was for bread, well, how are we going to categorize bread? You know, and, and how, because you think about this, I mean, we can and will see invoices for absolutely everything and anything. So actually coming up with that kind of taxonomy for all possible goods and services and how do you actually classify bread within the whole universe of anything is, is not a simple challenge and in, we've made some uh, initial progress on that but there's very much stuff still to do and again that leads me on to my next slide so I mean where, where are we going with all this in terms of machine learning well I mean the first point I've put here is improve everything it's important to say we're still a young company you know a couple of years in we have a very good essentially um, minimum viable product. I think it's fair to say at this point, but certainly I, am, as a data scientist with Improvise, recognise there's a whole lot more we could do, both to improve the stuff we've got and also to do stuff that we'd like to have. But um, yeah, I mean, I've put some examples here. Certainly, we to get more data in. I mean, you know, you can never have enough data and that could be from any source that we think is relevant, not just the invoices themselves. Uh, do, do more feature engineering. Um, of course, you want better models. Fraud and anomaly detection is an interesting one because, again, if we see invoices and we, at that point, maybe could highlight them as being suspicious and maybe there's, there's stuff we can do there. Uh, we have some sort of uh, basic anomaly detection in place, but I think you know, we, we recognise there's a whole kind of world of potential applications there if we took that on. Uh, yeah, do some more around the natural language and certainly uh, the man here on the front row, categorisation. And risk management as well, because what we're going to eventually get to a point of is the moment we're dealing with one uh, funder, but as, as we scale and grow, we're going to be dealing with multiple funders. So it's going to be important at that time to understand, well, what is the risk tolerance of this funder? Are there certain constraints that they've got around what they're prepared to fund, what not, and what kind of risk they want to take? So as, as we grow and we get more funders on board, then having this kind of portfolio analysis and understanding of the risk it's going to be absolutely crucial to us. Right, almost the final slide. This is the team. thought it was good to give a shout out to, to everybody. So, uh, Philip, and, and actually from this, I really just kind of wanted to show the kind of, <coughs> you know, background of everyone because I think we've got quite a, a diverse team in providing general, and that's certainly true of this subset of us in the data science team. But uh, Philip, as you see from a sort of financial background, he's the founder. Elias joined about 12 months ago. He's from a business and um, a more sort of computer science background, although has the MSc in data science, I believe, from Edinburgh Uni. Uh, there's me, I'm a sort of maths geek, I guess. And then these two guys, we've only just hired two weeks ago, so they, they're doing great. We, um, Marie has come to us uh, via a, a short career in digital marketing, but then she came to Stirling University, did one of the data lab sponsored MSCs uh, in big data, and she joined us couple of weeks ago, as did Armin, who's just finished his PhD in uh, kind of psychology uh, at Cambridge University, super smart guy as well. So, you know, we've got a really, I think, strong team, but I've just put there you, whoever you are, 
because we're always hiring, right? So, if you think you haven't been put off by my talk tonight and you might actually want to work with this madman, then get in touch. I mean, get in touch, right? Because we're not, act we're not actively hiring right now. I mean, we, we were, and we got uh, Marie and Armin. But as I said earlier, we are growing, we're scaling, we, we want bright people. And certainly the point really of me peppering this with slides and icons, uh, flags and icons, etc., is, you know, we'd love to have people from a kind of wide range of backgrounds, right? It's no good if we're all just from banking backgrounds and we all did maths. I mean, we want people who've got creative, different ways of thinking about stuff. So, although there's no actual uh, positions open at the moment, if you're interested, go to the website. It's um, previ.se. We're not a Swedish company. That's just the domain name that was available. Previ.se. And go to the opportunities page. And Scott Leishman, who's our uh, chief people officer, uh, he's more than happy to speak to anybody, and um, certainly, you know, by the time we come round to our next round of hiring, which I suspect now will probably be to 2019, but um, maybe sooner, but I think 2019 is probably more realistic, then, you know, register your interest if you're interested in not just the data science team, if you've got all the skills you can bring as well. And just, I mean, one last thing, actually, which isn't a slide, but before I finish off, is, well, two things, actually. Um, one is we'd, we're kind of looking for people for case studies, right? So if there's anybody out there who recognizes this pain of you know, having their own business, say, and having to deal with late payments, uh, please get in touch with me either tonight or via my email address, I'll show you in a minute, because we'd love to kind of, you know, we can anonymize as much as you like, but we'd love to have some kind of case studies uh, to be able to put. And, um, and there was another thing I was gonna mention, which I've forgotten, so, well, gloss over. That's what happens when you get old. You get a bit uh, do lally. So um, that's the end of me. But I'm more than happy to answer any questions right now, or for the pizza, or please do, you know, email me. Just email me there. Uh, find me on LinkedIn, whatever. But uh, anyway, hope you found it interesting. Hope you learn a bit about provise. What are we doing? We're getting businesses paid instantly. You're all going to remember that. Uh, cool. So any questions? Fire away. Thanks very much. Yes, uh, Just taking you back to the, you know, the one you said you mentioned, which is yeah, the fee. very, very reasonable. Um, I was just curious in terms of what the actual cost is to the, the customer, as in when they're not using Kermis, you know, like let's say it's a 30 or 60 day turnaround, mm -hmm. and you mentioned about loading money from the banks, you mentioned about three days lost on chasing up revenue. Yeah. So you just have a range there, you know, yeah, uh, so of, of how much real cost the income, so like, you know, maybe five, six percent or something? Well, no, I think, that's, I think that we've, um, and again, this, this work predates my time there, but I think we've done those calculations and worked out to be about 25% a year wow. in, in terms of their cost of borrowing, yeah. right? Yeah, and so our cost of borrowing, effectively, if you looked at it like that, is 12%, right, you know, 1% per month. And so... When we calculate improvements to working capital for the suppliers, then we work on this differential between, you know, what effectively get from 12% and what the average would be, which I think is about 25%. So that's how we quantify the benefits to suppliers. Yeah, sorry, I've got sales background, so I tend to think like that. No, no, it's a good, good, good question. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Um, we've got a couple of questions. Yeah. Your background is mathematics or sales? <laughs> Why? 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so the role of provide, um, are you actually cutting down out the risk or cutting down the risk yeah. that the, uh, was it the, the guy that gives them, the funder? Yeah, the funder, yeah. So you're cutting out, cutting down the risk of the funder and so the, I mean, the way I think about it, and again, I've only been here three months, but the way I think about it is the system as it is at the moment is broken and it's massively inefficient, right? So there's inefficiency there. And the inefficiency comes through in the sense that people are having to borrow against the risk of the supplier, which is a very high number because they're risky businesses. So in the way that we've structured this, and I should also say as well, actually, I mean, you know, I'm here as a data scientist, not a salesman, Data scientists talking about the kind of technical innovation here, but in terms of the business, a lot of the innovation has actually been around the legals. Because when you think about what we're doing, is we're paying on behalf of somebody on day one, and if 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 we pay for some bread 
to the baker, and then actually the supermarket 30 days later says, all that bread was stale, we wouldn't have paid you for that bread. Legally, we have to be in a position where we can do something about the fact that we've paid money out. Anyway, so I mentioned that because, because we've been able to go through the legal arguments about how this would work, we can effectively borrow against the risk of the buyer, which is a multinational, much lower uh, risk. So therefore, we can just borrow the funds at a much lower rate. So, and do the suppliers also large companies? So they can be, so the, uh, yeah, so it's, this is a good point actually. So I'm just going to name names, not that these are any companies that we're dealing with, but just to sort of put some colour on this. So if, if your supermarket is Tesco's and they're buying products from Unilever, Unilever is not going to want to use Provides, right? They're, they're too big. So, and they, they've got a great credit rating themselves, probably even better than Tesco's anyway, right? So, so they are not going to use Provides. What provides is for, and I probably should have said this, is more for the sort of small and medium sized businesses and what we call the kind of tail. Because some of the other solutions that are out there, which I kind of glossed over, they're really only applicable to the very, very large companies with good credit ratings themselves, right? But there's nothing out there for the small and medium sized businesses. So that's really, that's really our customer. So to, your, to answer your question, no, these big businesses are probably not going to want to use provides. But then when we deal with, with buyers, we kind of go through this with them, uh, work out which suppliers will be in scope, how to scope, and um, yeah, that's understood. Yes? So why are you interested in the risk allocation part? Right. So do you see um, provides bears all the risk? Do you have products that are faulty or there's suppliers in pay? Does that mean, uh, sorry, the buyer doesn't pay? So if you have a small supplier, like a farm, farmer or whatever, yeah. do you just selectively fund the invoices that are going to the big buyers? Because you might have small buyers as well. So, I mean, it's fair to say at this point in time, all the buyers are very large entities. You know, I mean, there's, there's not a name I could mention where people in the room haven't heard of, of the buyers. Um, what was the question, sorry, though, in terms of the suppliers and the risk? So what we're essentially doing is we're, we're kind of, and, and I'm not a legal expert and I've only been in this game for three months and if my boss Philip was here he could give you chapter and verse because as well as being the head of data science he's also uh, leading all our legals. Um, and I tried to read a legal document and my hat off to you uh, because uh, I really just could not get through the legalese on all this. I do know that there's kind of words like um, indemnify and all these kind of words that uh, probably mean a, a whole lot more to you than than a humble mathematician. But what we're doing is we're risk scoring, but then if we're happy at that point that we see an invoice, we're essentially buying a buyer claim, right? So we're, that, that's the way I think to think about it. We're, 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 buying, we're buying something. So if it's, if it's going to be an invoice which is gonna pay 100 pounds in 30 days time, we're actually buying an asset for 99 pounds today, and then we're accruing value on that at the rate of uh, whatever it would be to take it to a hundred pounds at day zero at the day at which the, the payment is due and then at that point we um, we then because we get money then from say the supermarket we can then bank it or then pay back the funding so I, I'm not sure if that answers your question and I must admit it's an area that I'm not too too familiar with but um, yeah would never have made a good lawyer yes at the back Yeah. No, I mean that's so that's yeah that's a kind of key thing for us. I think we call it dilution risk. I think that's the technical term there for you know what happens if we eventually have paid a bunch of invoices and then something happens to the buyer themselves. Uh, I mean obviously yes we we do look at that. Um, I believe that there's a kind of a pot of money 
kind of held in the middle of all of this which kind of buffers us against that kind of eventuality but uh, no you're absolutely right sir that we can't just do this by looking at the risk involved in the suppliers because quite clearly once we've paid a supplier's invoice the risk then to us is well we know we need to get that money back I suppose from the supplier's perspective they might still prefer to get even if you're saying I'll give you 95 billion pounds they're still going to be happier to get that if the company's going down to toilet so maybe there is a balance there at some point well yeah but that's that's where again the legal kind of arguments come in and I'm not in a position to, to really speak to that but um, in exactly that kind of situation what would happen uh, I mean I, I certainly know from the modelling piece that I've done that we do and will see invoices that don't for whatever reason get paid and then we have to write those off um, maybe not all at once but we kind of on a, on a kind of geometric basis write, write off a certain percentage every day uh, because we just know that um, we're not going to get the money back for those but um, no, it's a very good point that uh, we do need to look at both sides of the transaction. Yes, sir? So, the little diagram with pre and metal. Yeah. Uh, there was one link that was going to up the top that didn't make sure you guys. So, I'm going to. Wait, we'll make sure we can go back to it. Um, so, there's the, the basic problem is that people pay too late. Uh, this diagram. Yeah. So, you can charge things. So, for example, you, I, I believe you spoke to David before. And, you can actually give the buyers a bit of a deal if they pay sooner, you say, all right, we won't charge you as much, right? Yeah. So that encourages them to pay quicker. The supplier just now has to basically put a bit of a spread, something on top to make sure that uh, I've got to pay bloody interest payments while I'm waiting for these buggers to pay up. Yeah. Could you get any control over that and bring that down? Is well, that, I mean, that's, that's the line that's outside. Is, what, so what you're saying, are you saying that suppliers artificially increase their prices because they know they're not going to get paid? Not artificially, but yeah, I'm, well, I'm going to charge them interest knowing that they're going to... Well, and that's it, and this is, so if you speak to, so you know David, yeah. yeah, so I mean if you speak to David about this, the way that he characterises the present is that effectively the buyer is borrowing money from the supplier, right, because, uh, you know, and, and, and it's crazy, I mean, why should, for example, sort of Tesco's, borrow money from you know some like little corner shop bakery who's, who's supplying them bread I mean it just makes absolutely no sense whatsoever but that's kind of what's happened have we got any control over that well I mean not directly but because we're going to give them say 99p in the pound then what we what we would hope is because they're going to get that money on day one that it encourages them to sort of reduce this um, what it will also hopefully do as well is it may well encourage other suppliers to deal with companies that they were otherwise reluctant to deal with in the past because we certainly know of examples of businesses who won't deal with big business X because well they won't pay me for three months so I'm not going to do work with them however if they now know that they deal with big business X and X is using provides they're going to get paid the next day well maybe then you get more suppliers and then that naturally, through competition, lowers the prices down that way. So there's all these kind of effects that we may well see. Uh, yes, sir, in the middle. I'll come to you next. Yep. Uh, this is a question from the technical point of view. If you have an instance in the middle of a supplier and the value, both of them, or some of them, they have a sort of adaptation of their IT system. Because, for instance, the voice has to be analyzed. Yep. The yep. voice has to be a public sent to some press API or something like that right. in order to start the process. And what about on the other side? Because when the buyer is receiving the invoice, Sam has to emit a sort of receipt in order to close. Right. So this is absolutely, I'm glad you raised this, because this is absolutely crucial to the way providers operate. So one of our USPs, in effect, I mean, nobody else is paying at the point at which we pay, right? So that's in and of itself is unique. But the other thing that's unique is that we don't require any process change except for we need the buyer to give us invoices on a daily basis through either some kind of uh, FTP or you know sort of data dump in some sense so we don't need any change because what happens is the supplier will send their invoice to the buyer as they normally would but as soon as the buyer puts it on their system as they normally would we then through the next data dump see that this new invoice has appeared that we didn't know before and then we can kick off the scoring on that invoice and decide 
chewing, are we going to pay that first thing tomorrow morning or not? So actually there is no change to processes apart from this one data dump per day. One more question. Yeah, one more question. I, I work at Castlight, so I want to ask about categorization. Yeah, you could probably tell me a lot more than I can uh, answer to you. But about how you, uh, you said you, you need to, I'm curious whether you have one taxonomy or you adapt it to each buyer. Because I'm thinking about bread yeah. or, I don't know, uh, yeah, so a if supply I'm, of bread wouldn't be the same for a supermarket or an event planning Exactly. Company. Yeah, it's a scary problem, isn't it? Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah welcome to our world. So, <laughs> so I mean... Uh, yeah, I know, that's, we do this a lot. So we kind of, like, is, we stop... Do you have one taxonomy or do you have <laughs> taxonomy, one taxonomy per so, buyer? No, I mean, so the thing is, at the moment, we're operating fine without using any of this, right? However, we have done... So, no, but no, it's, it's an important point. But yeah. we want to use it, and we have done work on this. We actually engaged through the data lab um, with Harry at Watt University, I believe it was, to actually kickstart all this. Um, you know, so we've got some money in through, through the data lab, part of it ourselves, because it is, a, it is a big problem. I mean, you're absolutely right. Anything that you kind of learn for a supermarket is not going to be of any use if you then sort of, if your buyer is some kind of tier one investment bank, for example, and vice versa. So. But I think the work that was done, and I haven't actually had eyes on it myself, uh, at Harriet Watt, um, I think that related to uh, a UK retail chain, and I think they looked at it for three months and, and really made quite slow progress, with no disrespect to the people who are doing the work. I think it's, it is just a very hard problem. You know, the issue is clearly how granular do you kind of set your categorization, right? And, um, and I think that was the issue that came across. So, it's definitely, we have a kind of uh, an R&D roadmap for the kind of things that we are looking to work on in the data science team over the next sort of 12, 24 months. And categorization is at the top of that list and it's certainly something that we're going to come to. But note, for, for total clarity, it's not something that we're actively using right now, but we have done a lot of preparatory work to be able to get us uh, up to using it. Right, well, as I say, look, um, that's enough from me, you've all got homes to go to. I'm actually staying in Glasgow tonight, it's the first time I've ever had a night in Glasgow, so looking forward to that. That is my email address, richard at previde.se, find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I do actually, I'm gagging for a drink, so I'll probably just hang around here if Rob doesn't chuck me out first. But, you know, please, if you want to work with us, we'd love to speak to you. Uh, if you've got, uh, oh, the th yeah, the thing I forgot, how did I forget that? So I asked case studies. The other thing is, if any of you are kind of CFOs or, you know, chief procurement officers or whatever, or you happen to know them or whatever, I mean, send them our way, right? We've actually got a, an amazingly good sales pipeline and we're not really having to actively go out and, and find people now because they're coming to us. But if, you've, if you like what I say, it's not me, I'm not a sales guy, but I can put you onto the real sales people <laughs> who do this professionally and, um, you know, send them, send them our way. So anyway, that's all I have to say. That's enough from me. Good night. Thanks. <laughs> So, very nice to the end, folks. Um, thank you very much to Richard. Thanks to David. Thanks to the guys at Incremental. Thanks to Data Lab. Thanks to FinTech Scotland. Thanks to everybody. Um, up the back, can the guys from MBN Solutions make themselves one, please? My colleagues at the back, if any of you have any questions all around the talent thing and all that kind of good stuff, I'm going to need to nick away because my car's in St. Enoch Centre and I'm going to have to go and get that and bring it back. But thank you all very much. Thanks to Max Product Forge. Um, please stay for a wee while at least anyway. One last thing, if you have got any cups, glasses, plates, cans, please put them in the bin. Um, and the immortal words, I'm no your mommy. And I'm sure these lads up the back don't want to clean up after you. So please make sure anything you have here goes into the bins at the back. Thanks again for turning up folks. Hope you enjoyed the evening. <laughs> Wait a long time. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. Good to see you, but not really what we're doing. Talks, but. Yes, I think those. Yeah, I saw that. One of the guys. One of the guys on my side. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah.
Yeah, yeah. and then he, actually, so back in the early 2000s, Adam made two minutes after that, yeah. and he, he did it all in Excel, and somehow he managed to sort of screen screen, yeah. and he just, yeah, but he was using the other phone, so he only had like three decisions. I